You wanna know what the worst thing you could actually do is in terms of buying your first camera? Well, making an uninformed purchase and afterwards you got a camera for a thousand dollars that actually does not fit your needs at all. I'm pretty sure you are someone like me who spends countless hours researching every purchase over a certain threshold of money. In my case, this is 150 euros. To actually spare you a couple of hours, I compiled the ultimate beginner guide to cameras and all of their relevant features and in this video I took the most important 11 of them and tried to explain them for a beginner videographer so that at the end you can actually make a purchase decision on the things that are relevant to you. Why 11 you may ask? Well I wanted 10 and I couldn't decide which one to delete so I guess the last one is a bonus on top. And yes we are talking about camera specific features that are important for video shooting. If you like this kind of content and want to see more reviews, tutorials as well as other shenanigans then feel free to subscribe to this channel as well as give this video a like. Many factors. There are quite a lot of manufacturers in this field, which is great for us consumers, not only in terms of competitive pricing, but also in variety and specific needs. And every manufacturer got their strengths and weaknesses. There is Sony, which is great in their low light capabilities, as well as in autofocus technology. Canon has a wide range of lenses for the different mounts, as well as a great range of cameras for all types of shooters. Then there is Panasonic, which have some great bang for their buck cameras, such as the GH5. Fujifilm with their XT series, the newest iteration, can actually record in 240 frames per second slow motion. There is Blackmagic, which offers cinema quality cameras for a very affordable price point but without most of the comfort features and also there's Sigma with the camera and 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 and. Which one you choose in the end is always depending on what you are looking for and what you plan on shooting with it. Oh uh, and oftentimes uh, the range of lenses available for each system can dictate your purchase as well. Speaking of lenses well, lens mounts are an important part of choosing which system will be yours like forever. Forever, 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 ever. Forever, ever. Mounts are these thingies in front of your camera that you stick your lenses onto. Different manufacturers have different mounts. Hmm, obvious. Why you ask? Well, to lock you into the system. Forever, 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 ever. Okay, maybe not forever, but for a long time, since the glass you buy will stay even if you change your camera to a newer model. Glass is forever. Which mount you will choose in the end is one of the most important questions to actually answer. Canon has EF as well as RF and M mounts, so <laughs> depending on which camera you choose, you need different glass. All Sony cameras have an E-mount, which means all glass will fit on the whole range, including beginner and cinema cameras. The sensor inside of Sony cameras is the only thing dictating the end frame, but more on that later. Fuji has its X-mount, which almost all of the newer cameras use. Panasonic uses in partnership with Sigma and Leica their own standard called L-mount. And when you buy a Blackmagic camera, you can either choose between a Micro Four Thirds mount, an EF, or even a PL-mount, which is the de facto cinema glass standard mount. Now let's talk about storage mediums for a second, since this is also something that can make or break your decisions to buy actually a specific camera. The standard of almost all cameras is the classic SD card, which stands for Secure Digital, it's a standard introduced back in 1999. There are plenty of manufacturers offering quite a lot of different speeds, classes and sizes. Speeds range from standard to UHS-3, which has a maximum speed of 300 and 12 megabytes per second. There is also the V specification, which ranges from 6 to 90, which declares the minimum speed the card can ride. A typical 4K card should have at least UHS-2 with at least V30. Then there's the next higher class of cards, with an extreme price tag. They are called CFast cards, which stands for Compact Flash. Well, this was actually introduced back in 1994 by SanDisk. For price comparisons, you normally pay 1 euro per gigabyte of storage. 
which does not sound like that much. But when compared to SD cards, where one gigabyte costs 9.5 cents, then the same storage space costing 27 as SD cards ramps up to 256 euros as a CFast card. And then there's NVMe and SSD disks, which are virtually the same. The only difference is actually read and write speed. NVMe is much faster and often used in cinema cameras with higher frame rates. SSD are also very fast and can be used through a regular USB port, which makes them much more affordable for end users. You can get a Samsung 512GB T5 drive for actually $60. Speaking of frame rates, there's quite a lot to learn here as well. There are different standards. Some we are actually used to see, some we are getting used to see, and some that differ slightly depending on where you are actually from. 1 till 15 frames per second is mostly used for animation as well as time lapses. 12 frames is the de facto standard in animation. 24 frames per second is widely regarded as a cinema standard, a frame rate that is the minimum in capturing video that still has realistic motion blur. 30 frames per second is widely used for television to create a heightened sense of realism in movements. 60 frames is now the standard in gaming as well as in sports and live TV to remove motion blur from the footage and to capture more of the action. This is also the lowest setting to capture actually accurate slow motion. 120 frames per second and beyond is used to capture even more details in slow motion. Modern slow motion cameras can capture upwards of a thousand frames per second and more, which actually brings a grinding halt to scenes that are actually not visible to human eyes. Speaking of visibility, resolution. Cameras can produce different kinds of resolutions. The standard today is still Full HD 1920 by 1080 in horizontal or 1080 by 1920 in vertical, but it slowly shifts to 4K, which is actually four times the amount of pixels that are on screen when compared to Full HD. A lot of editors use 4K to be able to crop into shots, getting more angles without losing any quality when exporting it as a Full HD video in the end. There are also some cameras that use much higher sensor readouts of 6K and actually downsize it to 4K to get a sharper image. Some Blackmagic cameras shoot in 6K without downsizing. Some other cameras can shoot actually at 8K or even 12K. But right now 4K is absolutely enough for every shooting situation you encounter, especially as a beginner. There are also different sub-resolutions such as 2.8K which is often used for high resolution slow motion and 4K DCI which is a cinema screen 4K resolution which differs in the aspect ratio. Talking of ratios, 16 by 9 and 2.39 to 1 are the most common when it comes to shooting video. 16 by 9 is the standard high definition television ratio and 2.39 to 1 is anamorphic widescreen used in cinemas. Most modern cameras can capture in different aspect ratios natively, depending on the type of lenses you use to capture footage. YouTube predominantly has a ratio of 16 by 9, but can also be fed with a lot of different ratios. In the end, it comes down to preference and your playback medium. Let's talk sensor sizes for a bit. There are plenty of different sizes, each having different advantages and disadvantages. As a rule of thumb, the bigger the sensor, the better the image clarity. The smallest size sensors are those that you actually get in drones and smartphones, but they try to up the image digitally with AI and software. Then there's Micro Four Thirds, which is used by the Pocket 4K as well as some Panasonic cameras such as the GH5. Next is APS-C, which stands for Advanced Photo System Type-C and is slightly larger than Micro Four Thirds and actually next to full frame sensors, the most used sensors in consumer cameras. Which one you choose in the end comes down to what you are actually after in your filmmaking journey and what type of content you want to produce. Are you going for the filmic, long form content, short movies or even documentaries? Then you should go for a full frame sensor camera like the Sony FX3 or the Canon EOS R5. 
you want to produce more short form content, maybe even some vlogs or some travel videos, then go for a smaller sized camera with an APS-C sensor such as Sony's A6400 or the CVE-10 or even the Canon M50 Mark II. If you are not able to decide which type of content you want to produce, then actually go for the middle and try to get a micro for third sized camera such as the Pocket 4K or the GH5. Or go for the Sigma FP which is a great hybrid camera and can do almost everything. In the end, it always comes down to your preferences and what you think still looks good enough for the money you are able and willing to spend. Speaking of good looks, <laughs> let's talk about picture profiles and why they are actually very important for the content you will create in the future. There are many different kinds of picture profiles. Sometimes they are also called codecs. What are the differences you ask? Let's get into it. Almost all the cameras come with a profile that is either called standard or neutral. These have good colors, good contrast and look mostly natural right out of the camera. And they are perfect if you want to get your content out as quick as possible. <coughs> Vlogging. <coughs> they are not made for tweaking in post or color grading. If you want to do any of those types of things, then log profiles are the thing you should be after. They are super neutral and flat, look great out and actually somehow weird. The thing that makes them perfect for grading is that they retain way more details in the highlights as well as in the shadows and you are able to bend them even more to your liking, which also makes it easier to match two different cameras in post afterwards. And then finally, there are the cinema camera profiles that are usually called RAW formats. These are ultra flat, retain almost all values and can be tweaked in post even more than log profiles. The only <laughs> downside to these files is their ultra large file size, since this is uncompressed footage. Therefore, cinema cameras are often used with solid state drives which are vastly more expensive than SD cards. Most of these RAW codecs come with a standard LUT that transforms them to the normal Rec. 709 look, which is a great starting point to get the cinema color and grading you are actually looking for. Maybe you are asking yourself now, how far can I take my color grade without breaking the footage that I've actually shot? That's a good question. This heavily depends on your camera's dynamic range. Dynamic range? What is that? Dynamic range is a measurement of the range of light intensity from the brightest parts of your image to the darkest. It is usually measured in stops. The more stops your camera can record, the more details it is able to retain. To make it easy, a camera with less dynamic range will actually have crushed shadows and overblown highlights, while a camera with more dynamic range can capture a broader range of details. Also, marginally influential is the ISO value your camera is able to actually capture noise-free images at. The higher your ISO value is while shooting, the lower the dynamic range of your image will be. There are some exclusions to this rule, but that would actually be too in-depth for this beginner guide. But to give you a better example, the Blackmagic Pocket 4K can shoot up to 13 stops of dynamic range. The Sony CV-10 we are shooting on right now is roughly somewhere around 10 to 11 stops. And cinema cameras on the other hand, such as the Red Komodo for example, can capture 16 plus stops of dynamic range. So if you ever ask yourself why do movies actually look so damn good, well here is your answer. Now to something most cinema cameras don't have, because almost all of them are multi-crew cameras. We are talking about autofocus. Most of the cameras that are in the prosumer world of filmmaking have changed their point of view when it comes to integrating autofocus in their cameras over the last couple of years. Since there are more and more one-man operators shooting documentaries and especially a lot of content for social media, having a reliable focusing system is a must nowadays. Cameras, from Sony especially, have become the standard when it comes to precise and razor-fast autofocus modes. Especially the eye autofocus, which we are on right now, locks onto the subject's eye and is mighty impressive. This here is an example in which I created a razor-thin depth of field with an f-stop of 1.4 
and due to the autofocus, my eyes are still in focus, but my neck already gets out of focus. Almost all prosumer cameras starting from 2015 and newer feature some type of either face or eye tracking technology. And I have to say, I can't wait for the technological revolutions coming in the next five years. Speaking of technological advances, stabilization in its current form is another thing that has become actually really impressive in the last five years. When I bought my first camera in 2016, owning a gimbal for steady footage was actually a must and there wasn't much selection in that category either. Since then, vlogging and action sports have grown substantially, creating a new segment with new needs. And now, five years later, there are cameras with gimbal sensors, lenses that are actually rock steady, gyro data from dedicated chips inside the cameras, digital and hardware stabilization comes in all forms and sizes, action cameras now have AI powered stabilization on board that uses algorithms to counteract the rolling shutter in every single frame. In other words, stabilization has come a long way in a very short time. And uh, me and you are actually profiting massively from it. Speaking of profit, there's an unrelentless stream of new cameras released into the market every single year for every potential budget and customer type. Whatever your budget is, whatever type of shooting you want to do, there is something available. If you want to do this as a hobby or you want to start your first YouTube channel, then go for the entry-level cameras, learn and grow with them until you think you are ready to upgrade. If you plan to do this as a business or you are a very enthusiastic person that wants to do this well as his only hobby, then go for the top end products that are available in your budget to avoid actually dropping another big sum of cash six months later into the next camera with more specs that you wanted from the beginning anyways. There's nothing worse than outgrowing your camera within a very short time frame and then having to actually go through all the decisions once more. Simplest example in this, you bought a camera that can shoot full HD Max and your first client, friend, a band who wants a music video wants it in 4K resolution. No matter what, if you want to take a videography serious, then do not be a scrimp and rather stop going out for a month or two or three and invest the money afterwards into a better camera. So I hope this helped you in your quest to get a better understanding of cameras. And if so, come join this channel and like and subscribe to it. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask them in the comments and I or the community will try to answer them. My name is Leech and I'm off writing the next scripts. Have a great day, see you next time. Until then, goodbye.